Hey everybody, this is Bridget D and welcome to the Perfect Party Talk Show with Bridget D and that is me. Now listen, I want you guys to go get your friends. Come on now, go get your mama and them, go get your sister and them, go get your cousin and them, get everybody because we are here. For those of you who are uh, watching this show for the first time, welcome, welcome. I appreciate you. You're going to have a good time today. For those of you who have watched the show before, welcome back, family. Listen, we're going to top the last show that we had with the COVID. If you watched that, you guys are really, really watching that. Because let me tell you, we're up to about 1,300 views now. So we have a show right now that is going to be just as good. So I want you guys to know that this show is going to be powerful. Uh, I got some powerful men of God. Listen, if I had a wish list, these are the people that would be on it. Of pastors that are doing their thing in the kingdom. Yes, they are all my favorites. I couldn't pick one and say, well, he's better than him or he's better than him because they're all great. Okay, now listen, they're friends too. Uh, but today, I've got them on here because they are our pastors. So I had to dress up and put on my Sunday dress clothes, okay, because we do it online. So I don't need to wear my church stuff. So I dressed up. Yes, I dressed up. Um, because I'm honoring their titles today. But if we were just honoring them as just peeps and my friends, I would have my hat to the back and my jeans on. <laughs> doesn't matter. No matter what I got on, you still got me. So let me first introduce these powerful men of God to you. Now, some of you are going, I know them. I know him. Well, listen, there's some people that have been hit, hiding under a rock. So I got to do this in the proper manner. So let's start off with Pastor Jeff T. Osborne from Destiny Church in Palm Springs. Boy, what's up? Look at that hat. Now, come on. That's <laughs> that is Palm Springs. You hey, hey. come on. Ain't no sun on your face, not today. And, so, <laughs> <laughs> and also, we have the phenomenal Pastor Josh Beckley from Ecclesia and San Bernardino. Come on. Oh, Jeff. <laughs> Yes, he is. Yes, he is. And we've got uh, Pastor Alaric Singletary from Wind of the Spirit Church in Riverside. Woo, woo. Yeah. <laughs> yes. How you doing? And last and better not be least, my pastor, Pastor Tori and Scott from Harvest International Church in Brea, California. Come on. How's everybody doing? Come on and talk to the people. Are you doing well, sir? Yeah. Yeah, Fantastic. We're doing good today. Absolutely. Thank you for having us on today. Yes. I appreciate you guys. Now, listen, you guys, like I said, if this is about being real. Uh, I don't, anybody that's boring, they have to get by me because I, I just don't do a boring show. So all this calmness, we got to shake it out now. I know it's Come hot. On. Now, listen, Pastor uh, Jeff just said it was 100 and 2630 in Palm Springs. <laughs> No. <laughs> that's not it. He said it was Lithuanian hot. He yeah, said it was Lithuanian, Lithuanian hot. Yeah. Yeah, it's not, you know it's not of the Lord out here. I call that hell rehearsal, which I don't need. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's hot. It's definitely hot. But listen, and everybody, so Pastor Torian, how are you? You did a powerful message today. I watched it. I was at church online. So. Thank you. Thank you. It's very good. I, I, I just made it down here to Corona. And so, um, it's, 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 I'm feeling nice. It feels good to be good. in the sun. It feels awesome. great. And it's a lot of fun, that's for sure. Yes. Okay. And, uh, Pastor Al? Al. Good? All good in the hood. Uh, good in the hood. It, it, it's still hot in Riverside, you know, but, but we gonna make a way anyhow. Amen? You would well, think <laughs> Riverside, there'd be a river, huh? Did I miss right, that? you would think, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they forgot that part. They forgot they that. Did. They did, no problem. But anyway, so this show today is called Men, Math, and Ministry. And mm. I put it together because I really wanted to get a group of not just regular men, but, you know, men with authority, men who are doing a God's work. And we're just going to be talking about a few things. Obviously, the title tells you the categories. And um, I think this is going to be a blessing to everybody that watches the show. Um, some of the questions that I'm going to ask today are questions that you probably had yourself and or maybe you just said, wow, I never thought about that. I'm so glad she asked that. And if for any reason there's a question that I don't ask, uh, 
um, at the end, when I close out, we're going to just leave this up for those that are watching the Bree broadcast. Hi, how are you guys? Um, and if you have any questions that you're saying, wow, that one question she asked triggered something else that I really want to know, then uh, I've asked them to keep this uh, broadcast up on their pages, on their Facebooks, and, mm -hmm. and all their social media outlets. And uh, they're going to, you can put your questions in there and they're just going to keep their eyes on it and, you know, get those questions answered for you. So we're just making four powerful pastors available to you. I know that because we're doing church online, a lot of times you don't have that access to the pastors as much as you thought, as much as we used to have. So these wonderful gentlemen have made themselves available to answer some questions that um, are just going on with some of the things that are going on today. We're talking about some things that are going on today in our society, and uh, they're just going to be truthful about it and real about it because they don't know any other way to be, right? Right. Yeah. Yep. Great. Come on. Well, listen. Okay, so let me get to it. So we're talking about, you know, um, we're going to start off with men, you know, obviously that's the first category. And I know that it's, it's rare that you'll find a female uh, putting a panel of men together to ask them about men, you know, concerns, but I think it's necessary. Uh, there's things I don't know. And I'm, I'm going to ask the question. And like I said, you guys definitely been men. I've never been a man. So I'm going to ask you the way that women do. And if you need any kind of correction, I'm good. I'm open. And um, so anyway, we're going to start, start uh, with just the, the, um, as, as African-American men, okay, so let's just yeah. hit this one. We're just going to go for the jugular. You know, as African-American men, um, when you guys were watching or, um, well, all of them had videos. So when you were watching the, the situation with George Floyd and, and uh, with uh, Ahmaud Arbery and the situation with Breonna Taylor, you know, give me some of your emotions. Let's talk about that. You know, how, how were you feeling about that? Um, what kind of feelings rose up in you? Um, and, um, you know, like, what, it was on the news. It was everywhere. How did you do it with your children? Did it make you want to talk to them? And if so, how did you talk to them about this situation? So whoever wants to go first, you guys just jump in. Oh, um, I, guess since, I guess I'm the oldest in the group. And I've probably been around here a lot longer. Most of you guys, 65 this past year. Wow. I've seen this. Come on. Come on. I've seen this through my lifetime. Uh, mm -hmm. This is not the first time I've witnessed um, a death of an African American male at the hands of a police officer uh, or uh, somebody being essentially killed uh, for no apparent reason other than the fact that they were in the wrong place at the wrong time or just black, period. Um, but my feelings when I saw George. And the feelings when I hear about Brianna and the feelings when I hear about Aubrey. Um, the first, the first emotion I had was, uh, uh, was anger. And then uh, there was uh, despair. Uh, anger, uh, because uh, the first reaction was, here we go again. Uh, and despair, because with all that has happened throughout our lifetime, fighting for equality, fighting for civil rights, fighting for this not to happen again. Here we go again. When I just think about just recently the deaths of John uh, uh, and, and, and Vivian, mm -hmm. John Lewis and, 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 C, and C.D. Vivian, mm -hmm. two major uh, civil rights leaders in our country who just passed this past weekend. And, and the great and the work they did and I was reading their bio bios again this morning and sitting at lunch counters, being beaten, being souls, being bitten by dogs, uh, being brutalized by police, to walking and marching for the right for us to vote, for our right for us to and not have segregated counters, segregated bathrooms, segregated schools. And the fact that they made such strides to get us to a certain point of freedom and expectation and rights. And then to see in 2020, a man on someone's neck, a black man down on his ground with a white man on his neck, and he's pleading to breathe. Now, what bothers me most is he did not disrespect that man. He called him officer. He told him, I, he please, sir, I cannot breathe. And yet it was no mercy or no, no and, and, it, and it just welled up inside of me 
all the stuff that I watched over my history and over my life and even experienced in my life and realized, wow, are we still not where we need to be? Mm -hmm. That's my feeling. When it came to my children, my, all my kids are, you know, I'm empty nester. My, my oldest son is 40, will be 44 this year. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember when he was 16 and getting mm -hmm. ready to drive. Every African-American father has that talk with their son about what to do when you're stopped by the police. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I'm no different. I had the same conversation with my son. I told him what to do when, you get, when the cops get behind you. I told him what to say. I told him how not to react. I told him if they pull you out of the car and sit you down on the curb, you sit there, you do everything he tells you to do, and you tell him yes, sir, and no, sir. I said, the goal of this son is we got to get you home alive. That's the only goal. As it makes no different how it makes you feel. I know you're going to be angry. I know you're going to be humiliated. I know he's going to say things to you you ain't going to like. But son, you hold your peace. You keep your respect because the goal is to get you home alive. When you come home to me, we'll deal with it after that. But come home alive. Yeah. Got stopped three times when he was a teenager in high school mm. by police officers in Rialto. Wow. And he thank you for telling him what to do because those cops were trying to raise something in him. But anyway, that's I don't want to end up monopolizing, but that's my my reaction. No, no, no. I just. No, that's definitely, I mean, you have the perspective of, you know, for the time that you've been alive, dealing with it then and now, mm -hmm. so. Is that, anybody else want to comment on it? Well, I'll, I'll take the next leg because I'm not quite 65, I'm at 47, so chapter 47 this year, so uh, not, but I, I remember, uh, you know, Rodney King, y'all remember, well, some of y'all will remember Rodney King. But yeah. Can we all just get along? Can we all just get yeah. along? We're, and we still ain't got along. Uh, you know, it 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 does it, it it can't help but spark some type of emotion because again, it it's the same scenario played over and over again. And the only ongoing current theme is that at the end, for some kind of way, it's it's ingrained in our psyche that we know that the perpetrator is going to get off. We saw it with Zimmerman. We saw it with, with countless other officers, uh, and, and so. But now we saw the the the, the actual, uh, I guess, murder, if that's how you can call it, happen right play out before us. Before we see, we never got eyewitness news until you know really later on. But this is we like we were right there, and, and then you're you're right to what Dr. Beckley was saying. It 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 doesn't it can't help but spark some type of, of outrage or, or anger or, or resentment, um, you know, and that's when we would add, because this is supposed to be pastors, we'd add that, but God, you know, uh, that's when, you know, we yeah. try to remember that we're, we're Christians, uh, you know, right. and that we, we you know, we, we try to, you know, it's all in God's hands, but at the same time, uh, you know, there is a uh, an anger, and I do understand the scripture that says, be ye angry, but don't sin, so that's what I try to do, but now I am thankful. Uh, I don't have uh, driving age children just yet, but like Dr. Beckley said, I'm probably going to have to, I know I'm going to have to uh, have that conversation. My son's, I got a couple of years, but I do have a daughter that's getting ready to probably start driving next year. And I don't, last time I checked the way I'm seeing it on Facebook and Instagram, the law is not discriminating between male or female. It's just seems to be discriminating whether black or, or you know, or, or, or white or whatever you are. So you know, uh, I guess to your point, though, uh, to your question is, yeah, it, it, it did uh, invoke some type of uh, emotions that, of course, did necess uh, necessitate a response to me to have to uh, talk to my kids and, and, and try to rationalize this best that I know how. Yeah. Anybody yeah. else want to talk about this? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I'll, I think I'll chime in. When I saw Ahmed, um, Mm. Um, I mean, excuse me, Ahmad Arbery. Um, it hit home for me because I'm I, I exercise in my neighborhood every day. You know, I walk around the block every day. You know, and um, seeing the same scenery every single day. So when I saw these gentlemen hunt him down like a deer in mm. the street, it was so. It I just sat there like in awe. Like I'm like. 
I was awestruck. I could not fathom why, you know, and I, when I saw him fight for his life in that one last shot and he tried to run away and just fell down in the street, I just was like this, the, va the end value for life is appalling. Um, and then uh, I remember the, the, the next time, of course, I saw a George Floyd and I saw my brother Melvin po posted and he posted a picture and I was just like, I, you know, I can't take it right now. Like I can't, right. I can't look at right. it. Um, right. But he, he talked about how he shed tears, you know, watching. I was like, okay, you know, number one, the image already, just the still shot is disturbing. Mm -hmm. When you see a person's like neck basically broken, you know, underneath somebody's knee, you know, and the man is apparently dead. Uh, and then I just, shortly after I said, you know, let me just watch it. And I watched it and I watched it and I, I just wept and I cried. Mm -hmm. And my biggest thing was, I'm not even gonna say it was anger. It was more so like compassion of where, like somebody move his knee, like somebody accidentally bump him. I'm yeah. it's just going in my head. I'm like, I wish that some, somebody's gonna intervene. I'm watching to see, okay, somebody's gonna tap him out and say, hey bro, right. that's enough. You know, I'm, I'm trying to, and I'm hearing the man plead. And then when he cried out for his mama, man, I was like, this is a grown man crying for his mother. You know how much pain a man has to be, number one, in order to ask for some type of relief and not fight back. But then to ask for his mother in the middle, come on, man. So I just I just wept and I cried. I got angry, of course, of course. And then I have to take all my burdens. I have to take all my cares to the Lord and say, God, <laughs> unfair. Yeah. Because I, I mean, if I don't take it to the Lord, <laughs> I'm going to take it to the street. You know what I'm saying? So I needed to really say, okay, God, I need your help. I need you to give make, it doesn't make sense at all. And I understand what you say in John chapter 14, you know, 27, that, you know, that you are, you are my peace. And in John chapter 16, verse 33, where he says, you know, we're going to suffer some tribulation. We're going to suffer some trial. Um, but I need your peace in this situation. And so, um, of course, my kids we don't just sit there and let them watch stuff. But when the protests were happening and everything of that nature and uh, the protest was happening in Brea specifically, I said, you know, I can't let something like this happen in my city and me not show up. Show up. So I had to explain to them that daddy's gonna go to this protest and I'm gonna go and just make my voice be heard and allow my face to be seen in the community that I serve to fight against the injustice, to fight against the, the wrongdoings and we stand up for righteousness. And so I've had to explain it to them in that particular regard. So those were just my candid thoughts and my observations uh, from both of those cases. Yeah, it was rough. <laughs> rough. It was rough. Yeah. I know my, my feeling was a little helplessness because it was kind of like, if him, then me. You know, mm -hmm. if it could have been him, it could have been me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, I was wondering when somebody was kind of going bum rushing instead of video taking. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. They, yeah. That would at least let them breathe in and out over a couple of minutes, you know? Yeah, yeah. But okay, so and we're seeing that, um, you know, that this is obviously the racism thing, and in the, you know, we're seeing it as well rising up in churches too, you know, that black pastors, white pastors, things that are. Some pastors are not talking and on the subject and should, and some are talking and that kind of thing. But mm. overall, do you guys feel that um, that this whole challenge with the, this racism and the focusing on it and uh, uh, shining this light on it, do you feel like the end of it is will be positive? I mean, it's, it's you know, Pastor Becker, you were saying still, we're still here. But do you, at this time, do you feel that now it may end up in a positive way? Oh, in, uh, in, in, in continuing from that first question to this one, one of the things I was wanting to say too, after other pastors had a chance to say something, mm -hmm. that even in my experience, this one is different. The reaction mm -hmm. to this one is different than anything I've seen in my history. In my history, it has only been our community that has been outraged. It's only been our community that's been watching. It's only been our community that's been picketing and, and fighting. As majority of us, majority of us has been African-Americans fighting for this. This time is different. This generation, 
is responding differently mm -hmm. than my generation. This generation mm -hmm. and the kids across cultures are looking at this from a realistic point of view. And I believe this is going to be a different outcome because of the way this generation is responding. I've never seen more Caucasian millennials and more Caucasian people, period, involved in the issue of fighting against racism mm -hmm. and protesting against racism and, and standing up and making their voices known. I'm, 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 I'm blessed to watch on YouTube and on the other social media ch challenge, uh, channels, young adults, uh, millennials, uh, Caucasian millennials arguing with their parents about their paradigm and how they cannot believe you, you don't think this is wrong. And so um, the issue of racism is definitely a, a subject that the church has ignored. It's been there uh, from our existence. Uh, and oftentimes we only talk about it when something like this happens. And then we want to bring a black pastor or a white pastor to, in the church and we want him to poop it and we want to wash his feet and we want to do all that stuff. And we want to do all those things. And then once it passes, we go back to business as usual. Yeah. Right. Right, right. And I would say, I, I, you know, go ahead. Is, is, is that um, in this recent situation, I've shared with a lot of my white pastors, I said, they were asking me why we're battling to make racism a public health crisis in the county of San Bernardino. And we got that passed by the county supervisors. And now we're talking with Senator Leva and she's trying to get it brought to the state and make it a state initiative where racism is considered a public health crisis. And some of my African, my white pastors, when I was asking them to join me, at the supervisors meeting uh, in San Bernardino were asking me, why, what does this mean? How come, what, what, what do we got here? And they wanted me to sit down and give a whole big explanation as to why they needed to show up for this and why they needed to be there for this. And, and I thought to myself, mm. wait a minute, I'm, I'm not understanding this. We're supposed to be a body and we're supposed to be one. A few weeks ago, when you asked me to come to your church on May 31st to protest, you wanted to open up on Pentecost Sunday me as an African-American pastor, I didn't see anything new. My people were still paranoid. My people were 40% being affected by this. My people were still saying, mm -hmm. we want to stay home, pastor. We ain't ready to meet. We want to be safe. Well, you guys wanted me. Okay, I'm, I'm coming to your meeting. I'm going to listen to you. Then you want me to stand for you at a press conference. Now, it's not my issue. I'm not having to. My folks are glad. We're reaching out to them every day. They're satisfied. They're being blessed. We are, we're, we're doing all kinds of things to minister to them. We're still feeding. We're still doing all those things. I'm not getting any complaints about not showing up at church because they're scared. They want to stay safe, and they're going to want to come back until it's safe. Mm -hmm. and so they're glad to be online. They're supporting online. They're attending online. Their giving has increased online. They're doing all kinds of stuff online. And so mm -hmm. my folks, are, so I'm telling the white pastors, I'm not getting from my people what you're getting, but you tell me as your, your brother, you, this is a need for you. You heard, you want me to support you. I'm there for you. Mm -hmm. You don't have to give me a whole bunch of explanation. I'm mm -hmm. there for you. So I'm going, I'm standing in your press conferences and, and I'm standing up there with you and you're telling everybody whether the governor agrees or not, you're going to open on the 31st. Wonderful. That's your need. That's what you want. You, my brother, I want to stand for you. Now here's my need. Mm -hmm. My need is racism. My need is there's a systemic problem in our culture regarding racism that keeps dealing with putting African Americans in a situation where they're losing their lives. And we need to do something to change the system. And I need you to come stand with me. Not, not because you understand everything, but because as the scripture says, they'll know that we're Christians by our love for one another. You say you love me. I'm your brother. I'm, I'm, I'm a part of your family. So come stand with me. And then as you stand with me, I can explain with you as we go. But you're going to tell me you, I need to explain it. And if I don't explain it, white, you ain't showing up. Mm -hmm. One white pastor showed up. One. One. And so to me, when we can get past this issue of separating our issues based on culture because of the fact that as, as Christians, now I got to figure, figure out how it's going to make me look if I stand with you. Mm. What is it going to say about my doctrinal position if I stand with you? Wow. What is it going to say about, you know, what are my people going to think of me if I stand with you? Mm. But we're supposed to be one body. Yeah. So I still think we got a real serious problem with racism until we can start really being the church and really looking at each other across Culture, uh, not not colorblind. I'm not asking us to be colorblind. I'm asking us to be appreciative of each other's color and, and, and culture. And then at the same 
same time, recognize the mandate we've given by Christ that the way we demonstrate our love to the world is by the way we love each other. You need to show me you love me. Right. But you're going to tell me I love you, I'm your brother. If you need me, I'm going to be there for you. I don't know. My, my paradigm comes from the fact that I come from a large family. I'm the oldest of eight. I got four brothers. I can know I got, I got, I got five brothers, oldest of, of 11. And anytime any one of my brothers call and they say, Josh, I need you, they don't have to give me an explanation. Mm -hmm. My mm -hmm. question is, what do you need? Yeah. Well, we I, and, whatever it is, and I'm going to be there because you, my brother, you, you, my brother. We know that if any one of us calls any one of us and says, I need you, that is not a question of trying to sit down and give me a full-fledged dissertation about why you need me. The question is, what do you need? Right. We're gonna meet the need, then we'll talk about why you needed it. So how do you how do you um uh -oh. oh yeah I'm you feel it? Yeah. I'm sorry, I couldn't it just went out. Okay, so anyone else have anything to say on that one? Yeah, I think I, I know I've been I've been a little quiet while everybody's been sharing and I think that when this whole situation happened, um a lot of people were outraged at the knee in the neck. And uh, for me, I think my view was a little bit different. I was more outraged at the hand in the pocket than the knee in the neck. <laughs> and the reason nice. being is, is that the hand in the pocket showed the disregard for human life as if this was normal. Right. And when you look at what's happening and you understand our generation, which would be the millennial generation, I'm kind of on the back end of it, but I'd like to kind of love myself in there being 33. But when you look at our generation, it's important to understand that we are a, we are the generation of compassion. If you look at more of what's happening right now and you see this and this is where the battle between um, when somebody talks about somebody in this in sex marriage or doing this, you stand through the option. We see passion and my morals and my standards. Mm -hmm. And so when you see this two dichotomy between the two of us. We're, we're, or or you, in our generation, what you're seeing is more so than ever our generation, whether you're white, brown, black, Hispanic, uh, Middle Eastern, it doesn't matter. We are the generation of compassion. And when this moment happened, the larger issue, the deeper issue uh, that, that if we we're going to look at it, and this is from what I viewed and through this, is a deeper issue is the number one, I think Pastor Torian talked about it, it was the disregard for human life, period. It was the abuse of power and the disregard of human life, period. And, and I think this is the moment that, that people are beginning to wake up in this situation and begin to see that there is a disregard to that. And there is an abuse of that power, regardless of wherever they stand. And somebody had asked me in one of the shows, was like, hey, listen, the people that have been arrested who did this, you know, isn't that good enough? That was a large precedent of the people who were arrested. I said, but there's a difference between being arrested and convicted. Right. And, and I think that when you look at this, and, I, and I'm speaking from somebody who has been uh, in the system, if you will, um, and, and being, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from somebody who is the stereotypical statistic of the black African American male who was a former gang member, former drug dealer, was in prison for 16 years to life. So I tell, don't let the fedora and the smooth taste fool you. Your boy got a pass. And, and, and so when we look at this situation, having been on both sides of this situation, what we're dealing with and what makes this so different. Uh, that the doctor so eloquently talked about was our generation is the compassion generation. And so what we're seeing is the inconsistencies of this, but what is going to change is a, another question that happened. The change is not us getting and rallying in the street and, and burning things down and, and writing things down, posting a million posts on Instagram and Facebook and say, Hey, I did my part. I let the conversation go. It is the continued conversation on one end, but also it is the coming to solutions on the other end. And what we've seen is just constant conversations. We've seen constant coming to the tables and having dialogues and talks, and that has sufficed up until this point. But where we need to begin to transition into and make this more of a, more of a drive, if you will, is coming to the solution. Okay, we're going to have conversation, but it doesn't stop at the conversation. What are the solutions that we're going to, to create? And having those people around the table who can have those solutions um, is going to be key for us to be able to be in such a way that we're not allowing. Now, this is another side of it. And we're talking real and we, we, we got the hats off is on, from our people. 
is not being so angry that when somebody does genuinely ask who may be of a different color, that we're not saying you'll never know what we feel like because you're not my skin color. Because mm -hmm. then what we do on one side of it is if they're curious and like, man, how do we help? They may have been blind to that moment, but if they're asking, like Dr. said, we're not going to give this long dissertation behind it, but mm -hmm. let's give them the opportunity if they're asking to come to the table to now become so emotionally drawn out to where we don't, we're not able to educate them adequately on how to deal with this situation. There's a lot of pastors um, that I know who have some of the largest churches in America and they know they're supposed, and this is what you kind of see a little bit of the, 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 I call it the double dutch, right? You want to come in and you don't want to come in. You want to come in and you don't. It's because on one side of it, they know, okay, I got to say something. I can't not say something in this situation because I know it's wrong. But again, it's the education or the lack of education of understanding how do I come about this? And I've mm -hmm. seen a lot of great pastors from the African-American community take these other pastors who are, who are not black, um, who are white or of other, other eth ethnicities or, 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 or whatever it may be, and show them, okay, this is what it is that we're dealing with. And this is how you address this so that we can see the change that needs to take place. And so I think it is a, it is a combination of a few things. But like I said, where we're going to see this greatest change is not just in having the conversations, but it's keeping the conversations alive, not letting it die down and making right. sure that we are constantly providing avenues and outlets for solutions to come together. That's good. And that, that kind of segues me over to, so how do we heal and also educate others? I and think when I um, say others, others, I'm talking about those that are not white. Yeah. I think Jeff, Jeff's that. statement is powerful. And I think the, the answer is in the statement. Mm -hmm. We heal by educating. Okay. Yeah, the, if, as oh. we open our hearts and are compassionate, as we open our hearts and are accepting, recognizing that we need to educate, we need to be accommodative. We don't need to be angry. We don't need to be punitive. We need to be uh, gracious and merciful and be willing to those who want to learn be used by God to give that education. I think as our stories are heard and believed and we see results from our stories, it heals us. It heals us. Yeah. I think the anger stays because we're crying and we make a lot of noise and we feel like nobody's hearing us and we don't see any fruit come from it. I think our healing comes in the education as we give that information and we see the folks who take that information and work together with us as a there's a book I'm reading right now by a, a white pastor. It's powerful by Jeff. His name is Jeffrey Brent. It's called mm -hmm. Dismantling Racism. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, and I think it's a very powerful book because it's a white pastor talking to his white culture about what needs to happen in order to dismantle racism. It requires all of us, not one of us. The victims of racism cannot destroy a system that they did not create. Mm -hmm. It requires the people who created it to dismantle it but it requires the people who created to work with the victims so they understand the problem of the system so they can focus on the things they need to change in the system. Yeah. So I think- well, And I agree, uh, Pastor Jeff, but there are people who are really, they're genuine in trying to get educated. Right. And I've seen someone non-black try to ask the question, you know, help me to understand. And then it's like, you don't understand, you don't get it. And it's kind of like, I'm asking because I don't right. understand and I don't get it, you know, or, and, and, you know, you got to sit down, you know, you're so angry and upset that, that they don't get it yet. They're yeah. coming and saying education. Mm. And so, cause I'm really, yeah. I really want to know, you know, even yeah, can I say this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry about that version. Go ahead. Okay. One of the, when we talk about teaching, one of the things that my father taught me, my father is from Norfolk, Virginia, down south, right? Mm -hmm. And so my dad grew up in the segregation time. He grew up with a lot of that. And when my father became uh, a Marine and uh, we ended up doing it, one of the ways that my father educated me was something that changed my life dramatically. So when it comes to healing, I think it's important on it. On one side, yes, we want to educate uh, people from the other cultures, but it's also educating our own. And what I mean by that is my father taught me something that was so pivotal to me. We grew up in Huntington Beach. So if you don't know, there's not a lot of brothers during that time. I think we we're the only black family living in the Huntington Beach in Orange County. And I think I was probably the only brother who was out there 
uh, being a sponsored skateboarder and surfing uh, at the same time. Mm. And my father taught me something that was so critical. He says, son, you are not the color of your skin. You are the color of your character. And at the end of the day, one of the areas that was so pivotal for me that my father would not allow me to do is it to just lump myself into the color of my skin and say that is who I am. He says, son, you are a spirit. And when you understand that you're a spirit and you understand that who gives you the ability to be who you are, your identity is found in Christ. And at the end of the day, when you understand that your identity is found in Christ, God is bigger than any systemic racism. God is bigger than any problem. And so when I got out of prison and I have a strike, I have six, I have six counts against me. And, I, and I'm telling you this from six armed robberies and attempted murder. That was my background. And so when you look at this, when I was growing up, my father never told me, and I think this is a key for us, is that my, my father never started me off from a deficit. And what I mean by that, my father never told me because of the color of my skin, my life was going to be harder. My father never told me because of the color of my skin, people were going to deny me opportunities. My, my father never told me because of the color of my skin, I can only go so high in this situation, or I was going to fight even harder to be able to get this role. My father instilled in me that the God that is inside of me is bigger than any circumstance around me. My father instilled in me entrepreneurship to be able to build myself up and to be able to understand that I am who I am. Now, are there people out there who choose to have character flaws and issues and prejudices? You're, you're one million percent, uh, that's one million percent sure. But if we look at anything in history, one of the things that I've studied that was so big is uh, the Willie Lynch letter. And one of the things that Willie Lynch talked about is when you're breaking a slave, the idea is to break the mind and keep the body. And then mm -hmm. he begins to talk about, he says, but when you're breaking a slave, you never focus on the generation you're breaking right now in front of you. You focus on the generations to come. Because if you can break a slave good enough, they will break their offspring in the developmental stages to where you no longer have to do it, but they begin to do it themselves. And I feel like part of this healing process for us, and I can only speak for me, I can only speak in being born in 1986 and being 33 years old. Nobody has never told me that I couldn't sit at a counter. Nobody told me that I couldn't go to a certain school. Nobody's told me these things. Now, have I dealt with prejudice? Absolutely. But one thing that my father refused to do is to train me before I could even begin to dream and to understand my identity that I was at a deficit. Mm -hmm. And I think part of this healing comes from us on one side, educating those who aren't aware of our culture and understanding that. And the education happens on the other side where we as African-Americans are making sure that we instill into our child that the white man, uh, you know, the white man's out to get you. The system is out to set failure for you. Because if I believe that, let me tell you, with the statistics that I have, with six armed robberies and attempted murder, when McDonald's won't even hire me, I travel all over the world and I, I can't even get TSA pre-check because of my background. But the reality was, and the change was, is that if I understood my identity in Christ and I understood that, that what he said in his word, and how he, did, how, he, how he grafted me in Jeremiah 1.5 before I was even in my mother's womb. He already knew me. And so before anybody ever said a word about me, before anything, he had already called me before I took my first breath. And I think this was one of the big things to allow me to heal. Even when prejudice things happen, I could look at that individual and say, okay, that's a character flaw in their life, but it doesn't define who I am. And it gave me the ability to now at 33, not only be a pastor, not only travel around the world and train presidents, but also own a tech company um, and, and deal with these cats who are up there in Silicon Valley and with my background. And so I think healing happens both ways. It happens in re-educating, re-educating our young men to understand that most times we're taught to fight with these instead of fighting with this. Right. And so if we can learn how to fight with this, then we can overcome it because this, we've seen where this ended up. And so if we can learn to fight with this, then we can overcome what's happening and it is going to take a collective effort. And it is, I wish I could say that it's going to happen tomorrow. But I think that when we, we come together and we can re-educate on both sides is really where the healing is going to happen. But for me personally, as a pastor, it starts here recognizing my identity in God and saying he's bigger than any systemic racism or prejudice that I'm facing. That's good. Yeah. That's you know, one of the things that I would say, you know, I know I popped in and popped out, but I definitely get the, get the question. And it would basically kind of piggyback on what Jeff has said. Um, you have to understand as fathers, we are the blueprint that our sons and our daughters will actually yeah. follow. The Bible yeah. says that God could trust Abraham because he would command his children after him. And one of the things that I have as a responsibility as a father is mm -hmm. to model before them 
operating in purpose and living in purpose and living in truth and living in compassion and truly operating in my God-given ability so that I am a blueprint for them that they can look back and say, they don't have to, this, this is one of the things that, I, that I've said, and this is my prayer to God, is that I had to go some, in, in some regards to look for the things that I needed. I don't want my, my kids to have to go look anywhere I don't want them to have to try to, I don't, they're going to read books because I'm going to make them read books. They're already, they're reading books right now. Um, but I don't want them to have to go try to find their identity in a book. I don't want them to have to go try yeah. to find a mentor to show them how to do it. I'm supposed to be the example that they need and showing them how to navigate this life as a kingdom son, as a kingdom citizen. Yeah, beautiful. So it, it's so important for us to do that because there's another thing as, as things were going on in the world. And I remember sitting down with one of my coaches, uh, Coach Al Hollingsworth, and I began to ask him, I said, you know, what do you, what do you teach your kids? What, what should we teach our sons? Kind of like this kind of uh, thing that we're talking about. What would you teach your sons? What, how should we be talking to them? He said, and he talked to me about implicit bias. He said, you know, you have two fighters in a ring. They're going and they're contending for the championship. Mm -hmm. They both weigh the same. They both are the same height. They have the both the same record. The only difference that they have is one is black, one is white. Who do you want to win? He said, right now, tell me. And I was just like, well, the black one. He said, why? I said, because, I mean, he, he looks like me. He said, exactly. He said, that's your implicit bias. He said, they both have the same background. They both have the same height. He said, every single one of us has yeah, an implicit talk about bias. It. Talk but about here's it. the that's thing good. about it. Here's the thing. If any man be in Christ, he is a... New creation. new creation old things your implicit bias is passed away and all things become new he says so what i teach my kids and what i tell you to teach your kids is to teach them to be an implicit kingdom citizen You're that's what you be because the the kingdom it tr it, it truly transcends this worldly system You're and talking. so if i'm teaching my kids now i'm not gonna i'm not gonna make them so so heavenly mindly that there are no earthly good. That's not what I'm yes, talking sir. about. But I need you to know who your identity, who the true essence of you is, because the one thing that I will not do is instill into my children fear. There's That's where Boy, we get the word talking. inferiority on, from. When you have an inferiority process, there is a fear inside of you that will not allow you to, to go beyond what you're supposed to go beyond in order to be who God has called you to be. If we look throughout the word, every person that God used, he had to get them beyond their comfort zone, had to get them outside of their place of comfort, had to get them to go beyond their implicit bias, Jonah. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh, not because it was far away. It's because they, they, those, they hated each other. Any enemy of Nineveh, they were impaling them to the wall. So Jonah yeah. was like, nah, bro, I ain't going over there. I'm not about to be impaled to the wall. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, we, we, so but, but every, pers every person that God used, he called them to come out of the inferiority, to come out of fear, to come out of the, the, this worldly type of thinking, to begin to think of themselves as who they are. That's why he calls Gideon, you mighty man of valor. This man is hiding. Oh, what he, what he, he calls Moses, hey, you... <laughs> You're a guy who's supposed to be a deliverer. You're going to be speak, but I can't speak. He he totally, absolutely obliterates mm -hmm. the worldly condition to get them to think in a kingdom mindset. So I just want to say that that's what we're teaching our kids is that you got to follow God's purpose for your life. You got to know who you are and you cannot on, allow boy. anybody to think differently of you. I'll say this yes, and, I'll, and I'll pass yes, it on to someone else. I remember I was in fifth grade and uh, this person spit in my face, called me the N word, and I didn't necessarily know what that meant. I came back home. I mean, I knew it. I knew it hurt. It was like, and my mom, of course, she was hurt, and she said, "Son, this is what you need to understand. But if anybody calls you that word, you don't have to respond to it because that's not what's on your birth certificate." Boy, so you don't say that, to, Pastor. You don't have to respond because it's not on your birth certificate. That's not your mm -hmm. name. That's not who you are. She was showing mm -hmm. me who my identity was. She was showing me to get my value and my worth, not by what other people say, but why, but what God says and who she created and who she called me to be too. So that's what we teach our kids, that's not to good. live in fear. That's good. That's good. I, I miss all y'all. I'm definitely on point. I, I believe it. <laughs> I'm encouraged. 
But let's move over to the um, the mask. Let's talk about the we're going to talk about the mask portion of this, which is obviously the coronavirus and um, you know all that that entails and everything how it's affected our communities. And so, let me ask you this, um, and it's obviously from a man's point of view, obviously as a man. So right now we're dealing with a lot of uh, instability mentally. You know, a lot of men are challenged because uh, the effects of the coronavirus has them, uh, you know, out of work, um, you know, or they're in a position now where the wives are the breadwinners. And um, uh, how would you um, encourage uh, a man that was that's watching that, you know, has been taught to be the provider and then right now he's going through um, the fear of it all, uh, the fact that he is just really out of his element. And, um, you know, what would you do to encourage him? How would you, uh, and also, you know, with we as women, uh, wives, uh, mothers, all of that, who have men that are really trapped, challenged, I mean, have someone in their life, a man that's challenged in this area, you know, how would you, uh, what would you, advice would you give us to support them? You know, so whoever wants to go first in that, just, uh, you know, when it comes to men and, them feeling a little fearful. And you know, I know you guys are, well, I won't make a general statement. I've heard that you guys don't communicate well your fears and challenges. And that transparency sometimes is a challenge. Well, I think we'd, we'd have to start with one of the things that, that I am a huge proponent of um, uh, is pre-marriage counseling. And so I remember one of the first pieces of advice I got is, 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 uh, as I got married <laughs> was that, um, you know, you, you're all on the same team. You, 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 yeah, you know, good. we rise and fall together. Uh, we go through the storm together. We, we go, you know, through the rainbows together. It's all the same thing. So of course it, it is natural to what you're saying that, uh, you know, it, there may be uh, brothers and sisters or, or, or brothers who at this time, you know, uh, COVID has, has, has limited their, their employment services and, and they may be feeling some kind of way. But I think if we go back and we have to understand that in marriage, uh, we're all on the same team. We, everything goes in the same pot. It's not my pot and your pot, it's, it's our pot. And mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, it, it, in this season, it, there's going to be a feast and then there's going to be famine. But, you know, um, I, I think it really just speaks to you have to you have to know who God is in your life. Uh, preaching the sermon series right now, I'm talking about God is up to something. And so sometimes we have to be like Paul and we have to encourage ourselves. And I know it's real out there. I know that, you know, it, it, that discouragement can come in, but God, you know, it's, 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 it's keeping the faith. And, and, and one of the things uh, that I was taught in leadership is that, you know, um, as the head of the house, you 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 do come with the with the. Uh, I don't want to say facade, but I'll just say the 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 standing that everything is okay, that God is in control, that God is going to keep. No matter what it's looking like, no matter what it's feeling like, no matter what is happening, God is going to take care of us. Now I, I know that you know behind it, uh, you know in in the corner when no one's looking. You know, it, there is a realness that sets in that says, wow, you know, I should be uh, a man. The Bible says a man, you know, don't work. You shouldn't eat and all that stuff. But I, I, I get all of that. But I think really if, if someone came to me with that, I would really just point them back uh, to, to faith in God, that, that God knows what you need. He, he knows how to carry you through in the season. He's not ignorant of any of this. He's not caught by surprise by any of this. None of this has caught him off guard. So whether we're going to believe God is God or we're not, either we're going to believe he's a way maker or he's not, either we're going to believe he's going to provide for us Come on. or we're not. And so when you do that, when faith uh, supersedes fear, uh, when, when, when Come faith stands now. and says that fear has no place here, then, you know, yes, you sir. begin to, to, to deal with things and you begin to, to move. And, and I think, uh, I think um, as Jeff was saying earlier that, you know, sometimes, when we allow that fear factor in, you know, 
Is she going to leave me? Are we going to lose this house? Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to be the man of this house and I'm supposed to be taking care of this. But in the end, you are the man of the house. You are the high shepherd. Uh, like uh, uh, Pastor Torrance said, we should be training our kids and, and all that stuff. But at the same time, I got a heavenly father and he's my source. And so in those times, sometimes I have to go in my prayer closet by myself and cry out, Abba, Father. But, you know, now in front of the family, I'm going to be like, we're going to make it through this. Everything's right. going to be okay. Uh, God is going to make a way. He's going to provide. Now, in my my prayer closet, I'm going to cry out to the Lord. But he's going to, God is always going to be my, my, my faith, my source, my strength. And and and, uh, and I'm not telling you uh, theoretically. I'm telling you where I've been there before when when the job wasn't there and and it was pre-COVID, and, and I'm in that season of life, like, God, what's going on? And the wife was the breadwinner. She's the one bringing home the check. And I thank God for, back to my original premise, for that teaching that said, you know what? <laughs> We're all on the same team. Uh, it, that's my girl. That's my boo. Ride or die. Uh, you know, we in this together, and, and we've been together, and, and we processed. And it's supposed to be like that in the partnership. So the other part of this, too, is, and I don't mean to monopolize the time, but I really would sit back and Come have on, you reevaluate yeah. your relationship. Are you Good. guys partners? Are you in this together? Good. Are you life partners? Are, what's really going on? Uh, if we're partners, then, you know, you, you hold me when I'm falling and I'll hold you when I'm falling. And in the end, we win. In the end, God gets the glory. And so I understand, you know, being a man, there's been times when I've taken my dog for a walk. The reason why I took my dog for a walk is so I could talk to my dog. Why'd you talk mm -hmm. to your dog, Pastor? Because they didn't ever out, out for no response. I just don't want somebody to listen to me. I didn't want no response. <laughs> and my dog would just give me perfect, perfect uh, response. Yeah. Just wag her little tail and keep it pushing. Yeah, man, and God. so I appreciate it. Sometimes men just need someone to just vent. We just need to vent and let it all out so that we can just let go and let God and scream and then get ourselves together and get back in the fight. That's what your man really needs. He don't need you to offer a solution all the time. Sometimes he needs you to just come and rub his head. Amen. And, and pat him on the back and say, baby, I believe in you. Baby, I'm supporting right. you. I know it doesn't look good right now, but we're on the same team. And in the end, God is going to take care of you. I believe in you, man. I believe in you. You know, sometimes you got to talk to that man and tell him what he ain't before he is. Amen. You better say he is the CEO. Tell him he is the business. Oh, tell him what he's going to be. Amen. Don't tell him what it is. All right. Oh, all right. I'm done. Hey, man, y'all going to give me a preaching. All right. I'm gone. All right. All right. The door is I love it. Love it. You know, I would add to that. I, I think that it's so important to to recognize in this particular the pandemic does not cancel the promises of god in your life it, it does not and, and most people think that Amen. when there is a presence of trouble there's the absence of present help in the time of trouble so you have to know that if i am if you are in trouble know that that's not the absence of god that really is the presence of god and he's so near he's so close to you and this is your moment like i talked about this morning to be vulnerable before god you know in mark chapter 9 we always go to mark chapter 9 verse 23 uh, if I, if you can't believe all things are possible to him that believes, but if you go back and look at the context of that scripture, yes, you see that there is a father who is dealing with an issue, a son, a namesake, somebody who's supposed to carry on his legacy that's not working like he wants him to work. It's an right. issue. It's a problem that to totally uh, is out of his control. He can't beat it out. He can't scold it out. He can't ice cold shoulder it out. He just yes, has sir. to deal with this situation. And so finally, he comes to comes to Jesus and says, "Hey, this issue is too big for me. It's too it's too problemsome for me. I tried to bring it to yeah. your disciples, and they couldn't cast it out. So I'm bringing it to you. And I find it so interesting that when he brings his son to Jesus." He hmm. brings the son and he says, teacher, I brought my son to you. But then by the time he says, uh, he, he begins to talk to him about his son, he said, you know, believe all things are possible to him that believes. He said, Lord, I believe. You see the transition? In one particular context, he called him teacher. But when he was mm -hmm. about to get his breakthrough, he went from, tr from teacher and he transitioned to Lord. And I believe that in this particular moment, for men out there, we cannot just see Jesus as a good teacher. We can't just see him as a good prophet. We can't just see yes, him as, as a good 
uh, moral compass. Lord. I believe yep. that we need to truly submit ourselves to him and say, yes, Lord, sir. I need you. God, the one who created the, me, the one who fashioned me, the one who knit me together in my mother's womb, I need uh -huh. you in this moment. And we see that the father cried out and said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And I think that that's where all men need to get in that particular context. That's number one. Now, if you're talking about your, your wife being the breadwinner and all those different things, I have one simple sentence for you, and I hope that you take it to the grave with you. I hope that you live this out, and I hope that you plant it in your heart really, really deep to it so it can bring some fruit. God gave me this phrase long ago. He said, don't compete with her, complete with her. That's it. Don't compete with her, complete with complete her. Same thing with the woman. Don't compete with him. Complete with him. Whenever Adam saw Eve, he said, that is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. That's a completion of, of, of the part of me that I truly need in order to continue to have dominion in the way that God wants me to have. So don't compete. Oh, she's making more. Or he's making more. Or he does this or she does that. Forget about that. Complete with one another because what God gave you for one another is complementary. It means that it goes together and it works together. And that's how you have dominion. That's how you walk in the kingdom and the commanded blessing that Psalms chapter 133 says, if we would dwell together in unity, we will trigger the commanded blessing of the Lord. So that means good. that everything that we do, we're walking in step with one another, it means that nothing can defeat us. Nothing can overtake us. Nothing can overshadow us. That's why you see me, whenever my wife goes live, you see me commenting and liking and loving and all those yes, different sir. things. Why? Because I'm not competing with her. I'm completing with her. I want her to follow and I want her to operate in God's purpose. I want her to go out there and bust some heads. You know, I want her, you know, that's, that's, that's little Texas that came out. You know, I want her to be, I want her to be the Proverbs 31. I want our children to rise up and call her blessed. I, I do. And so it's not my job to be like, oh, you made $100,000 this year. All I made is 101. You know what I mean? Like, forget that junk. It's going to the same bank account. Know what I'm saying? You know, yeah. help your boy out some. But but I think that it's so important that we're not competing with one another, but we're completing with yeah. one another. We're on the and same team. Thing that I would I, say I when it comes down to fear. Uh, this season go ahead. will point of view. stretch a marriage. Oh. This season will bring out the the grit and bring out the truth of a marriage. This season. Yes. yes. God and what they really are. And as mm -hmm. it relates to believers, it is really important for us to heed what these two pastors have said, because this this test, this season will prove whether Christ is truly the center of mm. your lives, both individually and corporately as a couple. Yeah. Because everything these men of God have said is true. Because again, we're going to be talking about what, why God allowed the church in this season. There's 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 separation going on. God is trying to to deal with us, sheep against goat, wheat against tear. God is. God is proving us. God is getting us prepared for the great revival that's about to come. The great yes. that's about to be pulled yep. out. And he's, he's, he's trying to get the Gideon army together. You're separating <laughs> everybody else and getting the Gideon army together. It's the ones who are going to stand no matter what. And, and your marriage, your marriage is your testing ground. Your marriage is your place where you find out how to work with somebody, how to get along sure. with somebody, how to lift somebody, and how to hold somebody up, even mm -hmm. if it ain't you. Hallelujah. And therein is, is, is important. I, I, I just want to say amen. Amen to what these brothers said. <laughs> well, let me take this time to acknowledge your wives. Huh. Yeah. I love Hello. You, all of you who are powerful women of God. We've got mm -hmm. uh, Glenda, we've got Nadia, we've got Amber, and we've got Nova. These <laughs> women aren't just regular. You hear me? Powerful, yep. praying, fasting, women of God. And they are battling and beating cancer. They are kicking down the wall of the enemy's camp. So they're uh, my mentor, let's just say. Okay, I'll just put it out there. Mm -hmm. So is the next question, you guys. Listen, is right now we're in the last phase. We've been hearing that since I was, I was six. But mm -hmm. now we're here in the last phase. And um, what do you say to people who are like, well, I'm, we're living in the last phase. Let's like time is winding up for those who, you know, are, have that personality. And, um, you know, it's hard for me to dream. It's hard for me to plan uh, because I just feel like, you know, time is up. So is this the time to take risks? Is this the time to dream? 
Yeah, I love I love this question. This 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 is the one that that just has me like I mean on another level. The reason why it has me on another level is because I felt like you know everybody started off. Come on, every pastor said 2020 is the you you coming in with 2020 vision. Yeah. <laughs> every pastor everywhere, and then you get hit with and two stole black my eyes, notes. And you're like, wait, 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 what happened to my vision? I can't even see. And <laughs> and and I think there was a component that was missing that I shared is that in this moment, 2020 vision happens in two ways. 2020 vision, if it's something is unclear and it's blurry, then you're going to have clarity to be able to see that. And that's one portion that we began to speak on when it comes to vision. But the other side of it, uh, that how you get 2020 vision is anything that is obstructing your view is going to be moved out of the way so you can see what your view should really be. And I feel like in this moment, when it comes time to it, this is the moment where we had to decide who was our source. Amen. This is a moment where we had to yes. decide one of the biggest moments that transitioned in my life was the moment where, where you know, we talked about in Romans 12 too, everybody uses this verse, you know, do not be uh, conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind and you'll be able to test and prove and see God's perfect will. But when you look at that, that word conform, the word con is comes from the Latin word that means with. Form right. means shape or pattern mm -hmm. or system. So mm -hmm. he starts off by saying, do not go with the form, pattern, shape, or system of this world. But then be but transformed. To be trans means that you are crossing over. You are, you are changing your position and going over the form or the pattern. So he says, do not go with the pattern of this world, but cross over by the renewing of your mind. And I feel like in this moment, what we're dealing with, is recognizing who is our source. Because what mm -hmm. has happened is, is that we have made man our source and mm -hmm. God our resource. Mm -hmm. And I want you to, this is key because linguistics is powerful in this, is that what we have yeah. done is that we have said that God, you are a resource. Look at the word resource. That means to redistribute mm -hmm. what has been sourced. Right. And so our mm -hmm. vision has been twisted and man has stood in the vision of who was our actual source. And in this moment, what we're actually understanding is that when mm -hmm. we realize that God is our source, then God will use yeah. man to resource what he's already given to us. Yeah. And this is where it has shifted because we have gotten comfortable. We have become contained yeah. and allowing man to just feed us little scraps to, oh, man, I got to be this and I got to be that. And we have lost our identity of who God has called us to be because we forgot that he was our source. So we find ourselves leading our churches in ways that we never would have done. We find ourselves compromising our vision and our dreams. We have downplayed or minimized our dreams so we can maintain it because we lost fact or we lost sight that the one who gives it to us is not bound by any law here. And so when you understand kingdom, as Pastor Torian had talked about it through, through Coach Allen, what he has taught us in such an amazing way is you cannot pull out of a system something that is already within that system or that is not inside of that system. In other words, you can only draw out of what is inside of that system. So yeah. if our system is this world, then we can only draw out what is in this world, which is limitations, which is a lack, which is depression, which is anxiety, which is fear. Mm -hmm. And so you can only pull out of that system. But what he was trying to get us to understand is that when you cross over into the kingdom, we understand that there is no lack. There is no fear. There is no anxiety. Yeah. There is no depression. COVID cannot have yeah. a stand in your life. And so when That's Jesus it. came on the scene and he said, repent, we all know this. What he was saying was, is change your thinking because the way that you are thinking cannot operate in the kingdom. And so in order for us to review what God has, has called us to be and see this is the time to take risks. Because God says, you are going to get 2020 vision. Either you are going to believe that I am God, I am God all by myself, or you're not. Either you are going to believe that I am bigger than any type of economic downturn or anything that anybody feels, or you're not. Either you're going to believe that I am for you, or you're not. We cannot be what James talks about being double-minded. And in the yeah. Greek, it talks about being double-minded simply means that I am torn between what God says and what the world is saying. He says, you ought not think that you should receive anything from God. And so what we need to do in this moment, in this time, is be able to say, God, you are my source. Yeah. And, and, and this is key because we have to understand right now, Bridget and pastors, more than ever, look at history. 
Mm. Anytime there was a moment like this, there was a transfer of wealth. Yes. Mm. We are in one of the greatest transferals of wealth that we will ever see if we are in the kingdom. If we are viewing this with kingdom mentality, if we're viewing this through a kingdom mindset, remember this, we are not in an economic downturn right now of why companies are shutting down. We are dealing with a pandemic of a sickness, but money is being transferred. Wealth is being made. It's the only reason why me and my, my, my partner and my pastor, Pastor Ben Martinez, decided to launch a tech company in the middle of this. Why? Because we saw opportunity when everybody else saw obstacles. And so this is a moment for me uh, in my family and my wife and our church with our entrepreneurs and our businessmen that we're leading is Jesus says, he says, until I come, occupy. Mm-hmm. In other words, I feel like people were like, God, I just wish you would come right now. Holy yes. Spirit, would you just come and take me? That's a cop out. I feel like those are people who are not making a decision to live in who God has called them to be until he comes. I'm going to occupy. I'm going to take territory because the kingdom of God is about territory. I don't know. Y'all got me fired up. That, that Man. Helps, that, I'm Man. living it. Got us in. fired up. Amen. Amen. Oh, yeah. okay. This is a time for you to step out on faith, not time for you yes, to sir. pull back your faith. Yes, sir. God is about to show himself mighty in this season. Hello. God is. is going to do that. And I've been preaching that from the day we shut our door. On, Pastor. This is this is not an opportunity for the church to sway or to yes, sit sir. back and say, well, let's maintain until we can meet together. Man, it's yeah. a time to let God show you mm-hmm. some, give you some witty invention, give you some Hello. visions that you, I mean, bring the past visions you have and give you visions of how to do what you've been doing in a different yes, way. Sir. I'm telling yes, you, sir. Ecclesia has grown exponentially since we closed the doors. Ecclesia Hello. has increased since we closed the doors. We have a we have a broader ministry since we closed the doors. Pastor, we come were on, Pastor. Go into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come. Well, God said, well, let me shut the door so you can go do that. Okay. Hello. Yes. <laughs> yes. And so we've been doing that. We've been going into the highways and the hedges. It, this is not a secret. Look, I've seen God hand move more mightily on behalf of the church in this season than he has since we've been, when we were able to meet together and have all of our services. God is, if those who are willing to step on faith, God's about to, I'm telling you, all I can say is, you just keep, if you want to take a risk, risk God. You ain't going to never fail when you risk on God. Look, I told the congregation this morning to get you a promise, because my Bible says that uh, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promises of God, but strengthened in his faith and gave Amen. glory to God. This is the part that gave me. It said being fully persuaded that God has the power to do what he promised. Fully persuaded. That, that's it. If God gave you a promise, baby, it ain't nothing. Ain't COVID going to shut it down. Unemployment going to shut Ain't nothing going to shut it down, baby. If God gave you a promise, you just fear all that other stuff out the door. It gets you a promise. And keep going with it. Amen. That, that's the issue. Is he the source? The pr- and are you fully persuaded that he's the source? Yeah. yeah. And, and the word is pivot. I mean, right now, what this has caused us to do as a church is be able to pivot. Those yeah. who really are pushing to just get the church open are, are a lot of times men and women or pastors who don't want to grow and be able to expand the vision that God has given them. In this time, the pastors who are w- willing and able to relearn what they have been taught, being able to pivot, the word is pivot, being able to shift in a direction are the ones who are benefited. Just like you, doctor, we have seen a massive growth where we have we have given out over 200,000 pounds of food, yes. uh, over 200,000 care packages to those who are on our front line. We live in the Coachella Valley, Palm Springs, one of the largest LGBTQ communities in the world. And we have mm-hmm. we have every single week, we are alternating between giving hot meals to them and giving care packages, not just to the homeless. I heard uh, 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 D- Pastor Dino Rizzo uh, at a church of Highlands, he's like an uncle to me, he's one of the reasons why I was a pastor. He said, listen, when you're doing outreach, why are you standing in the line where everybody else is at? Yeah. Going to the line that nobody else is standing in. Yeah. And so we're delivering care packages to all of our grocery stores out here, mm-hmm. thanking them for being on the front line, the Home yeah. Depots, the Rouse, the Barnes, the Whole Foods. Yeah. Then we're going, we're alternating, going to all of our frontline workers in the hospital and giving them little notes and just little packages that are and meals and, mm-hmm. and li- not little, little prepackaged snacks that are just simply letting well, them know that we're there. Good. And I yeah. knew it shifted when a man who came to me and said, Pastor Jeff, they call me PJ. They said, listen, I'm the manager over here at the Vons. And he says, I'm a gay man, and I didn't believe in God. But I'm telling you, if anything, what you guys have done with these care packages have showed me what it means to experience the love of God. And I have been telling everybody 
to tune in and Amen. watch. And I'm so grateful for my spiritual mother and father, my pastors who have made a decision to pivot, to, to, mm-hmm. to understand, okay, listen, God, what are you doing in this time to grow us like never before? And they're mm-hmm. not so prideful that they're trying to stick into a, a way things should be mm-hmm. and, 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 and they stop being able to say, well, it should be like this. It should be like that. They stopped shitting all over themselves and decided yeah. to be able to pivot and be who God has called them to be. And this is where we're seeing the massive change because they're reaching more people than ever before. Mm, Amen. That's so good. Uh, and, uh, as you're talking so, about, I believe that the, the powerful resource God has made available to us, which is his source, is love. Yes, sir. And yes. that, that's what Jesus did to transform the world. He came and he demonstrated love. And we, we can't love. get caught up in this climate of anger, hatred, and frustration. We can't get caught up with all that's going on online with people railing again. The church has the ability to transform this environment if we would just practice what God has given us the ability to do. And that is to love. Love one yeah. another. He loved us. Jesus didn't come with a political hammer. He would have with a political purpose. He came with one purpose. Yes, sir. Transform us by the love of God. And yes, it was doctor. the love of God that got him killed. It was the love of God that got him crucified. Got him, got him crucified. But it was the love of God that transformed your life, my life, and the lives that we've seen. It's that love. And that same love will do the same thing if we as a church would just begin to practice it and begin to demonstrate it and begin to do what God calls us to do. Not with those in our circle, with everybody. <laughs> we have an opportunity mm-hmm. to be whole in this situation. We, ain't got an opportunity. we don't have to just be your little congregation behind the four doors anymore. You got an opportunity. Mm-hmm. Let the love of God stretch throughout the whole the globe through the social media aspect and, and within your communities, as Pastor Jeff was talking about, reaching out to people who are not inside your church, outside your church, and and demonstrated them just like that gay man said. He didn't say I didn't I I, I was I was touched by the ph- philanthropy of your church. That's, yeah. I was touched by the generosity of your people. He didn't say, you know what, I think you guys are genuine preachers. He said, you guys did this and it made me understand the love of God. Mm-hmm. God said that they will see our works and, and see our good works and glorify our Father, which is in it. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. And, and, you know, as you're talking about dreams and you're talking about love and I'm thinking about, you know, all of the amazing things that were just said and, you know, to add to that, when you're going through a problem, when you're going through a trouble, going through issue, most people think that I need more faith. I need more yeah. faith. If I'm feeling a right. doubt situation. Right. I need more faith. Right. I need more faith. The opposite of fear is not faith. Right. The opposite of fear is love. The Bible mm-hmm. says perfect love cast yeah. out all fear. All See, when you are finding yourself Amen. in the midst of fear Amen. overtaking you, you don't have a revelation of love. See, <laughs> in Matthew chapter six, and say, hey, oh you guys, I'm looking at what am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? What am I going to wear? And all of these different things. He said, I need you to go back to the original. I need you to go back to the beginning and look at the lilies of the field. They don't wow, toil. They don't feel the so birds of the air. Look at all. They don't gather in the barns or nothing like that. Aren't you much more than they? Trying to get them to understand. I love you more than them. And the reality yes, why you're finding yourself in this anxiety and this fear and this doubt and I don't know if I can dream again is because you don't have a revelation of the Father's Come love on. for you because all yeah. things yeah. work together yeah. Say that. for the good for those who love, love God and called according to His purpose. You got to know that the way that you're going to operate in faith is by mm-hmm. love. The, love. Faith yes, works sir. By love. The only way that you're going to operate in God's purpose is by his love with the basis that God's got you. See, the issue that most people have right now is that they're looking at the issue. They're looking at the pandemic. They're looking at the economics and they're saying, man, God, uh, I don't know if I'm, 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 I'm secure in the yeah. covenant that I have with you. Yes. But the Bible tells us that he knows what we have need of before we even oh, ask for it. Which means That's that it. God is waiting on you to ask for it on the basis of the love relationship that you have. He has yes, it, sir. but he's yeah. waiting for you to ask him for it. God, I need you to help me. To you, You've given me this vision for a yeah. business. You've given me this vision for a tech company. You've given me this vision for a ministry. <laughs> God, yes, sir. Out of the love, Father, out of this love, I'm asking you, how am I supposed to do this? But see, the issue is that we yeah. don't have a revelation of love. We've allowed fear. We've allowed the world. We've allowed things. But he says the right. remedy to all of that is seek first the kingdom of God. Yes, sir. 
righteousness and all these things will be added to you. God wants you to live an add to life, not trying to get out there and get out there and make it and grind and hustle and all of those different things. God wants you, he wants to navigate you to the right deals. He wants to have you have Come a on, career. pastor to be able to put things together. Do you recognize what God did with Noah, that he gave him a creative idea in the midst of a generation that had no concept of what a boat was? He gave him cubit by cubit, foot by foot, exactly how to put it together on the basis of his love. And so, so much more so with you. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just kind of give you a coaching session right now. You have to stop hey, come on, coach your cues from the world. You have to stop taking your cues from all of these worldly, quote unquote, successful people. Say it. Not the successful worldly man. He no. tells us in Proverbs, seek first. He tells us, excuse me, meditate in the word day and night. And you shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth your fruit in your season and your, your, your leaf will not wither. And whatsoever you do will prosper. Wow. Stop looking at the unrighteous. You got to get back to looking at God's word on the basis of his love yes. for you and follow him and stop following all these gurus, these Instagram, whatever the case is, because they don't have the map for you. The Bible says that his word is a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. So you got to move forward in God's love and his word for you. That's what I would say. It is time to dream. Stop putting it on the back burner. Yes, yes. So this is the time. So we, basically, you guys are taking away all the excuses. So... So the answer is get to it and what are you doing now about that dream? Mm -hmm. Do it. Do it. This is, when, this is when God works the best. Mm -hmm. Hey, yes it is. Mm -hmm. so you definitely, you know, people will definitely know it's God. Yeah. Like, how did you make a million dollars in a pandemic? <laughs> well, see, here's the, here's the other thing. In Romans chapter 4, verse 17, the end of that, he says uh, that, of course, Abraham blessed God who was, to, who was able to bring or create two things out of nothing. You got to understand that this is a season where God is bringing new things out of nothing. And, and that's what he wants to do with you. And he's not waiting for the, for a quote unquote economics to go to the next level. He's not, he wants to create new things out of nothing. That's who God is. He doesn't want you to have any basis of, of, of this foundation of, okay, I, I can see how it can work. That's not faith. He wants you to, he wants to create new things out of nothing. So that's, that's a word for somebody, whatever you have right now, it's enough for it's God enough. to get started. <laughs> New things well, that's out it. of it. I need everybody to write that down. New things. Oh um, my God, I got notes going. My <laughs> Lord. <laughs> New things out of nothing. So that takes away your excuses right there. Yeah. Okay, so I know we have just two more questions and then we're going to close this thing out. Listen, so we got challenges in the church and we know you guys are thinking out of the box. So you guys kind of answered that question because you know that God is picking you out of the churches so that you can go do purpose, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so we got a lot of young adults that are kind of taking the lead in the community. You know, they're out there marching, they're doing things to make things right, you know, obviously with the black community and everything else. My question is, um, do you feel like the, the young adults, uh, are, youth and young adults, are just uh, taking the same initiative in the church? Have we taught them well enough? Have we given them the tools that they need to be just as assertive for God as it is for the community? I, I think we probably haven't taught them well enough, but I think the bottom line is, as God trusts every generation that has come on after Jesus, God trusts them too. And so therefore, our responsibility for those of us who are older and now are going to be passing the torch on is that we need to trust and equip them with the leadership that they need to have to not only take over the legacies of our ministry, but to take on the leadership of our culture and our country. Um, the book of Proverbs, Psalm 73, talks about teaching the next generation so that they would mm -hmm. understand how to carry this on and teach their children to do the same. Uh, I think too often what happens with those of us who are older and generations that come behind us, uh, we tend to have what I call the senioritis mentality. It, it, it's kind of like the idea when you're in high school and you get as a freshman in high school, right. you think right. you be tough when you're a freshman and you know everything. But when you get a senior and you look back at the freshmen, you think they stupid and they don't know what they're doing. And but yet don't forget four years ago, that's where you were. And those yeah. seniors were looking at you in the same way. We tend to bring that over to the church. 
I started pastoring when I was 31 years old, 32 years old. And I started leading Ecclesia and founded the church at 32 years old. Now, wow. I got 32-year-old young people coming up in my church now. And I got seniors my age talking about these. we can't trust these kids with leadership because they're only 32. I said, I was 32 when I started. And you and there was God trusted me with leadership. And therefore, we need to trust them with leadership. We need to start training them. As a, and so I think we need to. I think this generation is well-equipped. I think they're I think they're well equipped to take us to another level the church ain't never seen before if some of us old folks get out the way. Mm -hmm. I really do. I think we're gonna we're gonna see some innovation. We're gonna see some things in ministry that we were so stuck in our stuff that we were doing, afraid to come out of that, thinking that it was not holy or not righteous. And they're gonna show us how to reach folks that were unreachable. Yeah. Because of what they have, what God has given them in terms of not only ju just their innovation, their ability and their education, but with their cultural savvy and with their ability to be able to 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 relate cross culturally without the biases, some of the biases that we grew up with. And so uh, I, I think this generation is quite well, well equipped to lead. We need to put them in position to lead. At Ecclesia, that's exactly what we've done. I've got millennials on my board. We've deliberately done that. I got millennials on my staff. I got I, this millennial that does all of my, tells me what to do on social media because I, I can't get nobody my age to do this because they don't know what they're doing. But I got a millennial that teaches me, instructs me, and guides all my social media stuff and, and does my online services for me. But we're raising up millennials because my my issue is as, as as I am transitioning and I feel in the next ten years I got to get out of the way that I got to I got to get these young people and I let, let them know I have confidence in their ability and in their yeah pastor their yeah doctor that they can take over and I can just move out the way and then I come behind and follow them as they lead and so yes uh, without a shower that I think the church it, it the church needs to. We have a mandate. Now, let me put it this way. We got a mandate in scripture, Psalm 73. We're supposed to be doing this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah. I think there's a big difference between, I think in coaching, as Tony says, when I have my, you know, my, my coaching practice and I have a lot of my clients, when you coach, you, you, you learn how to ask the right question. Yes. And if I would, I would, I would kind of ask the right question. I would kind of rephrase the question and I don't think the issue is whether or not we are equipped as a generation. I think we're well equipped. I think we have some of the greatest communicators of our time. I think we have the potential to be able to do great things. But what we lack, and we kind of talked on this earlier, is this idea of sonship. Mm -hmm. and, and the challenge with that that happens in our age is that as young men and young women, we use sonship. We have a messianic rabbi on staff. Shout out to my rabbi. I love him, Rabbi Brian Belechi. And he mm -hmm. talks about how in the Hebrew, the word sonship is not indicative to a sex or a male or female. It is not a uh, position. It is a posture. That's right. And so when you talk about sonship, it, it's including in women and young men. And I almost liken it to a book that I'm writing called Son of a Gun. And, uh, and what that is, is we always call people like you, Dr. Uh, 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 Dr. Beckley and, and, uh, and Pastor Al, we, we call you guys guns. And, mm. and so what does it mean to be the son of a gun? And I liken it to the analogy that those who are around us, spiritual fathers represent the guns, and we as sons and daughters represent the bullets. Mm. Aside from one another, both are ineffective. The problem with our generation is you have too many sons who are bullets trying to be guns. You mm -hmm. have too many sons and young people who are trying to lead, but they've never been fathered first. And yeah. so what happens is when we get into positions of leadership, we abuse it because biologically you cannot be a father unless you've first been a son. That would be mm -hmm. called mutation. And so what we have now in our generation is we have a generation of young people who are driven and we know we're supposed to go further. But we, we are trying to be the guns when we're seasons where we need to be bullets. Mm. And what happens in this idea of sonship is as a bullet, you know, once it goes into a chamber, it's in a tight spot. It is in a confined space where you almost feel like you're losing your identity as a young man or young woman when you know God has called you to do something great. But mm. if we understand the process of sonship yes. in that tight space is where our spiritual mother and fathers give us the push that yeah. we need to be ejected from that gun. And the only way that you know a gun is effective is that the gun's job is to point the bullet in the right way, give it its force, as Dr. Beckley had talked about, that allows us to hit the goal together. And the goal of that bullet in that sun is to go further. The bullet always goes further than the gun.
Mm-hmm. And that's why I'm so grateful for my spiritual father who has always given me, and I'm telling you this, if you're watching this and you are a senior pastor, Dr. Beckley, you have said it so amazingly well, is mm-hmm. that my pastor has always given me a seat at the table. Yes. Every time that I have gone to a conference, he never said the green room is only reserved for me. You go eat lunch with all of them over there, but I'm going to go over here. My spiritual father, Pastor Obed Martinez, gave me a seat at some of the largest tables that I have ever been around and said, see, son, this is why you want to do this. This is why you don't want to do this. Why? Because when I get into that realm, then I am not I'm not compromising my integrity. I'm not compromising who God has called me to be the, the job of a father is to affirm Mm -hmm. and validate. And that is why he has affirmed me and he has helped validate what God has already affirmed in my life. And so I think with our generation, if we can learn on both ends to have amazing leaders who are deciding to become fathers and mothers to this next generation, and for us as a generation to sit and understand, listen, I can learn what took them 20 years in two years or a year of apprenticeship, if you will, so that I can master what I need to be able to master and go to where I need to go. And so I think that the answer is yes, we are equipped to be able to go further than anything else, but you cannot have authority unless you are under authority. And that is where we have to learn that because just like I say, if my son who is, uh, my son is 12, my daughter just turned 11. If my son is doing something to her and she tells him, uh, if she tells him to stop, He's going to look at her and be like, you know, shut your mouth or be quiet or whatever it is. So she'll come and tell daddy. And then when she comes and tell daddy, I give her these words. Tell her, tell him that daddy said. Mm-hmm. And the moment that he hears daddy says there is an authority that is higher than where he's at. And immediately he listens. So me being 33, a lot of my validation has come because I am a son that I'm standing in mm-hmm. the place that I'm standing in. And that when I have the assurance or the validation or the stamp from my spiritual father, it gives me a place at the seat of the table, at the seat of the table, allows me to speak because I've learned to be able to learn, grab and grow from that. So I think sonship is a big thing for us to be able to carry that baton and having great pastors like, um, like Dr. I don't know, like Pastor Allen, Dr. Beckley, to be able to pass that on to, to people like us. We're going to be able to see some great things happen. Awesome. That's so great. I'm so, that's so great. Word. I appreciate that. The final thing, and you guys take me out with this, um, what do you think that God is, what is God saying, what is the Holy Spirit saying to you now uh, about the assignment of the church? If, if it hasn't changed, I would you say it hasn't changed than it was before, but I just want that to be the thing that closes things out. So everybody just, if you're watching, I need you to sit up, sit close, and listen. So we can start with uh, Al. Let's start with Pastor Al. All right. Um, I've always been feeling lately as it just pertains to where we are. I, I think this is really a season where God is, is again, what Dr. Beckley said, this is a, a time when God is, is really setting us aside and, and apart so that we can restructure, refirm, recommit, reconnect. Um, just a time when, when God is saying, let's, Things have gotten out of priority. They've gotten out of whack. You've allowed distractions and hindrances and all this other stuff to take place with with what should have been uh, personal time with me, personal growth with me, personal uh, devotion time, more more time. Listen, I I have spent more time because uh, just 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 the, the freedom of not having to worry about this and worry about that, because you know how easily distracted we are. Uh, but we're not running here. We're not running there. We're not going this place. We're not going that place. It's a time now where I just really have found more time to be with God and be in his presence and being in his, in, in, in just where he's at and being just sit under daddy's feet for a little while. Uh, I think God is asking us during this time to just reestablish and re mm. reconnect with him. Let's, let's, let's seek ye first the kingdom uh, of God. Uh, that, that, that's where I think that we're at. Um, I think also too, the other thing that as I keep hearing is, is don't, um, don't neglect the time. Um, many of you all, cause I know I said it all the time. I would always say, listen, if I had more time, I would do X, Y, Z. If I had more time, I would do this and I would do that. But now guess what? I, I sure enough got the time. 
And so for me to not get stuff done is not, it's not it redeem the time. I think that's the thing that I keep doing. Redeem the time. Listen, um, th 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 there's a time to, 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 to sow, you know, and a time to reap. There's a time to laugh and a time, you know, to cry. There, there's a time. And I think God is saying this time, listen, uh, uh, what's that Verizon commercial? Can you hear me now? You know, mm -hmm. I'm removing all the distractions. I'm removing everything. Can you hear me now? Now, when, now that you can hear me uh, clear and I, I've got your attention, uh, um, you know, distractions out the way now. Now I need you to do what I told you to do. I, he's kind of reordering, restructuring, reprioritizing our steps because, you know, we, we kept recalculating our own GPSs and, and, and making turns where we had no business making turns. And God's saying, no, I'm going to shut this all down. If your job was your issue, I'm going to shut that down. If 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 uh, social media was your issue, I'm going to shut that all down. If anything that was distracting you from me, I'm shutting it all down. So now you've got with me. The other thing that the last thing that it, it probably has been. Um, I've been more aware is now, you know, uh, Dr. Beckley, he's you know, his kids are grown and gone. But I can tell you now I'm enjoying more time with my family um, being. Uh, c connected because we're at home all the time. Uh, you know, we're having fun. We're playing games, uh, you know, and just being in each other's presence. And I think we forget how important it is for us to be in each other's presence, to Good. to speak well, to hug, to touch, to laugh, to giggle, to enjoy life, to live life more abundantly. And I think God is saying, listen, in the time that you have left, let's, let's enjoy every ounce of it. Let's, let's love harder. Let's laugh more. Let's, yeah, let's just be in his presence more. Let's just enjoy this. I, You know what? At first, I was going a little crazy like everyone else. And, you know, the spirit of fear was is like, oh, my God. But you know what? I'm really enjoying this time. I'm really enjoying being with dad. I'm be enjoying uh, being with my kids. I'm enjoying that God is up to something, that he is restructuring yeah. things, that he is uh, reprior to re prior pre uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Prior to, Reprioritizing no, that word right there. Amen. In, in, in see, see how we connected like that in the spirit. Anyway, Come on now. We're in the spirit. <laughs> even in my church, I'm just, uh, we're getting more stuff done. It's amazing. Like Dr. Beckley said, listen, we're more effective now as a ministry since the doors have closed. We're getting more stuff done. Finance. I'm, I I'm love, you know, the people are still trusting God with their finances. That was one of my things. I was like, all oh, these people ain't going to give. But no, my, my people who are called, you know, the God's people who are trusting him for all this stuff, they, they are giving into the kingdom of God and reaping the rewards. And so I think during this time, I think the last thing, the last point is God's just saying, no, listen, don't lose hope. God is up to something and it's going to be wonderful. In the end, we win. In the end, we win. We win. All right, I'm done. Pastor Tori. Yes. Oh, um, my goodness. I believe that in this time, of course, the kingdom of God is the message. But I believe that what God has done over the past, since March, I believe, well, since the beginning of this whole year, uh, when everything shut down, I just got this analogy and this, this imagery of God calling his kids into this this table, this long table, shut the doors and just brought everybody close and said, this is what I need you to understand. I need you to do. This is the time of purpose. This is a time of you truly walking in your God-given authority. This is your time where you walk according to the identity that I've given you, which is sonship. This is a time that you go after yeah. every single mountain that you go yeah. beyond the walls to be and to share the light of jesus christ that you go and make disciples of all nations that you go and you truly uh do do business until i come occupy till i yes, come sir. i believe that this is a year of true dominion i believe that this is a time of dominion um i believe it's a time of mastery that you truly stop trying to be like everybody else and you be yeah, the you talking that you can be um, so many other people want to be like everybody else, but there's a me only that the world has never seen yet. And I believe that this is a time where you you dig down deep into who God created you to be, what he called you to do, and do it unapologetically. And I believe that that's the message to 
the church at this Amen. particular one. I mean, especially with our church specifically, you know, when God called us to, to, to build Harvest International Church, he gave me, he gave me the vision that this church would be full of leaders, entrepreneurs, people who are business owners. Yes, sir. That's what we have in our church. We have like 98% of people that come, come on. have a business. They are leaders. They are people that are out there doing things. And my job as a pastor is not for you to come here and sit up and make me look pretty. My job as a pastor is to equip you for the work of the ministry that you are you for. And that ministry may not fit in the four walls of this church. That, that that ministry may not be behind a pulpit or sitting at sitting in a discipleship group or whatever the case is, but that ministry may be you going out and being the biggest, best leader that you can be in your space, the place where God has called you to. That's the ministry of reconciliation. That's you truly living out your God-given potential. That's the light that the world needs to see. The light is not for the light. And so I believe that that's what God is commissioning all of us to do with all of the shutdown, with all of the things. He'll use it. I don't know trade it, but he'll use it and say, okay, yeah, go to the beach and do church. Yeah, go and do home groups. Yeah, start meeting in the in the homes. Yeah, go and do these things because that's what I've been trying to get you guys to do for the longest time. Again, so right. it's, a time of, it's a time of mastery. It's a time of dominion. It's a time of truly living out the true commission, the, the commission that Jesus gave us to go and make this and, uh, and truly live the kingdom. It, that's, that's what I believe. And that's what I'm going to take uh, from this particular. Amen. Awesome. Pastor Jeff? Yeah, I just, uh, I mean, they've, they've all said it all, but I think it's just uh, pure identity. Not so much as, as recognizing who you are, but more so honing in on who you aren't. And what I mean mm -hmm. by that is the more you can begin to uh, pull away from yourself, what you know you're not, all the thoughts that people were trying to say, you're this, you're this, you're that, you're this, you're that. It's once you remove who you aren't, then you can focus on who you really are. And that's when you begin to step into your identity and begin to receive all that God has for you. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Good word. And ending with uh, the wonderful doctor, Dr. Jack. God bless you. <laughs> this is the, to me, this is the season for the church. When this pandemic hit, the scripture that God gave me was Second Chronicles 7, 4. If my people fall by my name, humble me, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, and I will hear from heaven. I will go. He will heal the land. When God gave me that in my spirit, I really heard God say to, to me that in this season, in this season is how God wants to glorify himself in the earth. With everything that everybody has said, with the church being mm. all those things and doing all those things in this season, this is the season for the church. This, this, this country is not going to be delivered from covert by politics or by, uh, by, by, by even by vaccines. We're not going to be delivered from racism, by legislation or by changing us. This, this, this culture, this season, this time is going to be changed because the church will rise up. And the church needs to understand we need not mm. to be into this, we need not to be afraid of this, we need to be bold in this, we need to be intentional about this, and we need to be purposeful about this because God has given us this season for him to use to use the church to glorify himself in the earth and to raise the church to the level that God intended the church to be in our culture and in this world. Mm. I, I think about history, and I think that in history, whenever there was a moment when God displayed his power in the earth, was that he allowed it in the midst of a critical crisis in the world when yep. Egypt and Israel with Nebuchadnezzar and Israel and God displayed his power from heaven and the earth is because yes, it was sir. time for the church to rise up. It was time for Israel to come out of slavery. It was time for God to be glorified, for Nebuchadnezzar to recognize who God was, for Pharaoh to recognize who God was. This is, this is that season. I believe yeah. the world don't, the reason why it's a world pandemic reason why racism is a world issue, not just in the United States issue, is because God is about the church rising up and truly not being ashamed anymore, not sitting back in the shadows, not acquiescing and not compromising and not just taking its place based on where the world tells it to stand. But now we stand where God has called us to stand. We're, we're the greatest change agent in the universe. Yeah. We are the greatest change agent in the universe. Amen. We are. That's what God put us here. We are the greatest change agent in the universe, and the world needs change. And it's time for us to start being who we are and start being ashamed of who we are and whose we are and start standing and declaring and believing and doing yes, 
things that God has called and given us to do. This is this. Hello. That's what I sense God is saying. We're in this, and the only reason we're staying in it as long as we are is because the church has got to get up and do what it's supposed to be doing. And I believe that's exactly what God is speaking. Every single one of us have spoken to that because that's exactly what God is doing in the body. Every leader who is sensitive to the Spirit senses that, knows that it's time for us to step out of the shadows and start taking leadership even on the global level level in our world. That is so awesome. I'm so excited. I'm so motivated. I got some things I got to go do. <laughs> because of the words you guys have said today, but I just want to say this in closing out that you guys have uh, blessed my soul. I know you've given vital information. You have given the charge. You have taken away excuses. And this platform was set up so that people can fulfill their purpose in the call of, of God on their lives. Amen. And so now that people may have needed another, they need a nice little session. So you've given it to them for free. And uh, I'm glad that you did it on this platform. I thank you for your time. I love each and every one of you. Keep this platform in prayer. Uh, pray for me to be covered. Okay. Um, you guys are my brothers, and that's my, I report to you what I do. So I thank you so much. And as I say with the Purpose Party all the time, for those that are out there, purpose, if not now, when? God bless you. I love you so much. I will talk to you guys soon. Bye-bye. God bless you. Bye. Gentlemen, you all be blessed. We're praying for you, man. We're adding you guys to.